Very beautiful city, and I guess that the Hochschule Strasbourg is the only university in Germany that is literally a stone's throw away from the beach. So uh, pay a visit to Strasbourg University and you will be uh, in an extraordinary, extraordinary place. My name is Jan Christian Kuhr and I'm professor at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering or School of Mechanical Engineering. I'm trained as a physicist and therefore I'm giving lectures in the first term for beginners in physics and also measurement technology. But in the master course, my favorite subject is renewable energy because it's a fascinating topic for every engineer, a great chance to contribute to energy system of the future. Today we will talk about hydrogen and this talk will uh, seamlessly uh, connect to the previous talk of Professor Gulden because he already has introduced the necessity of um, uh, hydrogen. And we will talk about uh, possibilities how we can generate and create hydrogen and for the energy of the system of the future. Let's have a look at some slides first, and I should give you a motivation. So I hope you can see my slides, and I uh, turn over to the next slide. I guess you can see now slide number two. Let's talk about the energy system of the future. Of course, the energy system requires electrons because all of us we need electrical power that's no secret but it has come clear that the energy system of the future also requires molecules namely most importantly hydrogen what you see to the right is the first ever running um, hydrogen powered train in germany it's also worldwide the first uh, hydrogen powered train operated by a hydrogen fuel cell. And even in the political agencies, polit politicians have become clear or are aware nowadays that the energy of the, system, the future does not only consist of electricity but also of hydrogen molecules. So, where do we get the hydrogen molecules from? We have an almost infinite source of energy, namely the sun. The sun sends down to Earth energy by means of small energy packages called photons. A photon is a particle that carries a small, tiny amount of energy. And all these energy particles come free of charge all the time, and we can make use of them. So let's talk about how can we utilize the power of the sun in order to create molecules for the energy system of the future. Let me put a challenging question. Can we do this? So we start with the power from the sun. We start with the power from the sun and we add some water, which is earth abundant, of course, and the result is hydrogen. So the equation runs like this. Photons plus H2O equals to hydrogen molecules. Is that possible? That seems almost a weird and strange question. But the answer is yes. In principle, it is possible. Let me be precise. In principle, we have uh, made great advances in the past years, and there's a long way to go still. And when we do this, we call the molecules, the fuels, solar fuels, because they have been created by photons from the sun. So let's think about which kind of solution architectures do we have, which options do we have to convert light into hydrogen. So it's all about the question mark, 
in the middle. Shoot. So let's talk about this question mark here. So hydrogen is the goal. The energy source is the sun, and we need to turn the power from the sun into hydrogen molecules. So let's start with the end of the game, with the hydrogen molecules. So this is what we need to achieve, what we want to produce. And of course, as Professor Golden has already made clear, hydrogen should not be produced from fossil fuels. That would be contraproductive because we want to have a clean environment. This requires no use of CO2 altogether. So hydrogen must be produced in a different way than we conventionally do it. And you may guess the idea to produce green hydrogen is to use electrolysis. Electrolysis requires electrons. So we need electrons in order to do and to run the electrolysis and in order to produce hydrogen. And that electrons should be, of course, created from green and renewable energy sources. So where do we get the electrons from? And the idea is that we use a, um, a sort of light absorption where we absorb the photons from the sun in order to produce electrons and that electrons in turn we use to do, to do and to run our electrolysis. This is the way how it works. So which um, parts should, which uh, components should the energy conversion process that starts from the left and ends to the right, which components should that energy system or the energy converting device have? Of course we need a first step of conversion, and that is a conversion of light to electricity. You see a solar cell that perfectly does the job to do the conversion photons into electrons. But we also need a second step. And the second step consists of a conversion from electricity to hydrogen. So we use, we take the electrons that we have created in our first step and feed them into the second conversion unit and in turn we get our hydrogen molecule. So now, which solution architectures we can think of? How can we accomplish this? So at the left hand side we have still our photons. The photons have energy. Energy is Planck's constant times frequency. H times nu is the energy of the photon, as you may know from high school, I guess. Then we have a photovoltaic device, solar cell, and we have an electrochemical cell on the right-hand side, EC. So PV is photovoltaic and EC is electronic, electrolytic cell or electrochemical cell and we want to produce hydrogen. Okay, the first solution is just to have two separate systems, PV and EC, and to connect them just over the public grid. This is how we do it right now. If we produce green hydrogen, then we have some green electricity created somewhere in the net and we transport it over the grid to the electrolyzer cell or the DC device. So this is nothing new. But we can well think of another option. It looks like this. We have still our photons. We have our hydrogen molecules. And now you see that the PV and the EC components have come much closer to each other because now we integrate those two components into a single device. This is a medium integration level. So we need some power cable 
you can see it here, but it may be the same device. So it, you could think of uh, an apparatus consisting of two components integrated into the same, uh, into the same device. And uh, the benefit of such a solution is uh, that the, the system costs are expected to be low. And this is what we actually, uh, where we actually have some demonstration projects. One of this is PEXIS. PEXIS is a demonstration of how to combine a PV and an EC cell into a single device without the use of the electric grid. So it could be installed on top of a roof of a house with, without the use of any connection to the power grid. But there's also a third solution. And the third, third solution, how to do um, a transformation of photons into hydrogen, is to use a so-called photoelectrochemical cell, PEC. And in this case, you see there are no two distinct components, but it's a single unique component. So both PV and EC are functionally present, but they are monolithically integrated into a single device. And in this case, the integration level is very high. So this is still um, open up in the future. There are some uh, devices operating under lab conditions, but you cannot commercially buy it right now. But it may happen that we can use such devices and uh, uh, buy such devices in five or ten years from now. So let's, let's first of all talk about the EC, the electrolytic cell. This is all about converting electrons into hydrogen molecules. So this is uh, how a typical EC module stack looks like. It consists of many, many EC cells and they made up a uh, stack. So, um, an e electrolytic cell is an uh, electrochemical device that runs the process of electrolysis. In this case, we want to split water, therefore we call it water electrolysis. And the operation principle is like this. So we have, let me, sorry. Um, we have an aqueous solution or electrolyte. And we have two electrodes, electrodes an anode and we have a cathode. In between, we have an electrolyte. This is a real electrolyte. So H2O is just not the electrolyte, I'm sorry. Uh, please, I should correct. It's just a feed in material that we want to split apart into two molecules, H2 and O2. Um, the electrolyte is much thinner than you uh, might guess from this diagram here, but that electrolyte is capable of transferring or is permissible for protons, H+, from the anode to the cathode. And Externally, those electrons are wired by means of some cable where the electrons can travel. So we have two charge transportation processes. The first one is the ions, so these are the protons which travel through the electrolyte. And the second one are the electrons which travel the external circuit from the anode to the cathode. And then we will see this, if we put the right uh, voltage to this device, then we will see that uh, the hydrogen H2O, uh, the, the water molecule H2O, will run into an oxygen evolution reaction where we produce oxygen at the anode side and likewise we will produce hydrogen gases, hydrogen on the cathode side. If we put energy into the system. Now let's have a look at what happens in the electrolytic cell. So first of all we have 
an anode at the left hand side. Then we have some electrolyte. I just indicate the electrolyte by this dashed line. And of course we have the cathode. We feed in H2O into our on, into the anodic side. And then we connect anode and cathode. And I should by the way headline here. And here we have power source, electrical energy. The voltage is U. And we connect the anode to the cathode such that the electrons can travel in this direction. And the electrolyte is capable of transferring protons, H plus. So which reaction will now run on the anode side and which reaction will run on the cathode side? So we have H2O in the liquid phase where we start our reaction with. And if we put energy into it, then we will get two protons in aqueous environment plus one half mole of oxygen in gaseous form plus two electrons. Okay. So now the, the protons, they will travel along the electrolyte and enter into the cathodic space. And the electrons, this one here, sorry, I should, to, should use the red color. The electrons will go this way. So it's important to see that in the electrolytic cell we have ions, in this case protons, which travel through the electrolyte, and we have electrons, the other carrier sort, sort of carrier, which travel the external circuit. Circuit. So what happens at the at the cathodic side? At the cathodic side, we take our two protons. Two H plus an aqueous environment. And we add the two electrons that have traveled this way. So we add the two electrons in order to yield a molecule H2 ah, sorry so so this means that we have the total reaction it's like this H2L H2O, sorry, H2O in liquid form or liquid phase. Then we have two two protons on the right side and two protons on the left side, so we cancel them out. And we have two electrons on the right side and two electrons on the left side of the reaction, so this cancel out. The overall reaction is H2O 
is split into one half mole of O2 in gaseous form plus one mole H2 in gaseous form. And this is exactly this where we are interested in. So this means that at the anode side we will have an oxygen evolution reaction. Oxygen evolution reaction and on the cathode side we have a hydrogen evolution reaction. Okay, so now it's the, the important question is how much energy do we need in order to run this reaction? So let's focus on this equation here. And now we have to uh, be clear on how much energy do we need in order to do to run this reaction. I should make a little bit more space. So, which amount of energy do we need? So delta G is the so-called Gibbs free enthalpy. And this, the amount of the delta G decides on how much electricity we need to put into this reaction. The Gibbs free enthalpy, enthalpy is equal to the number of electrons that we need per molecule H2, and there are two electrons, times the Faraday constant, times the difference, the chemical potentials. So it's all about the chemical or the electrochemical potentials. So now, if we look at the electrochemical potential of this reaction, then we have two electrochemical potentials, or let us, uh, let us write down the electrochemical potential of phi in this direction, then we have one potential for the H2O to O2 reaction and we have another for the H plus to H2 reaction. So this is the anodic side and this is the cathodic side. So by definition this is zero volt, the H plus to H2 reaction is by definition zero volt, and this one here is 1.3 volts at standard conditions. So this difference is delta phi is equal to 1.3 volts under ideal connect, uh, under ideal uh, Condition, but maybe go up to 1.46 volt or even more. Okay, so what we need to keep in mind is this energy diagram here. If we multiply the voltage by the elect electron charge, we get an energy diagram. And we need to make transition from 
this to this energy state. And this we do by electric energy. Okay, then it turns out that delta G, the difference in Gibbs free enthalpy, is about 286 kilojoule per mole. And this amount of energy must come from our electrons. Okay, so far, um, now we go back to the slides and we'll show you uh, some more slides on the next steps that we need to do for our reaction. Okay, now because we have um, lost some time now, let's switch to uh, the next part of our, um, of our journey from the photons to the hydrogen molecules. So the, the first part was electrolytic cell that turns electrons into molecules. The second part is, which in the series is before the first part, the second part is now how do we get the electrons? We get them from converting photons into electrons. This is how a normal, how a normal photo, a typical photo, um, photovoltaic cell looks like. It has two, it's built upon silicon as a semiconductor. We have a peat shot P area and and a, a P doped area. We have an N doped area. I skip this for time reasons. What is more important is this. Um, on the energy level, as you may know, a, silic, a semiconductor has a valence band and has a conduction band. Okay, the so valence band is filled with electrons in the ground state. The conduction band is completely empty. The band gap difference is called EG, and this in between, there are no allowed states. The energy is increasing from the bottom to the top. And if we have an N-type silicon uh, semiconductor, then we have a Fermi level. The Fermi level is so uh, something like an electrochemical potential. And the Fermi level is close to the bottom of the conduction band. Now, when we have uh, photons, impinging on, on our um, PV cell, the photons have an energy which is equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. And if the photon energy is greater than the band gap, then we can create electron hole pairs. So we we uh, hit, the photon hits an electron in the valence band, and the electron is lifted up to the conduction band and leaves behind a positive vacancy, a charge. This charge behaves like a single particle as if we are positive by charge. So we have two particles. We have a negative electron in the valence band and a positive hole in the, sorry, a negative electron in the conduction band and a positive hole in the valence band. If the energy of the photon is larger than the band gap, then the final state of the electron in the conduction band may be higher than the conduction band minimum and gets relaxed down to the minimum by a short, very short cascade of the staircase down to the bottom of the conduction band. The same is true for the holes. They, they are very quickly relaxing down to the maximum of the valence band. So if we now have a P-type silicon, so it's the same material, but it's differently doped. So we distinguish between N-doped and P-doped. If we have a P-type silicon, then we have the very same situation with just one difference, and the difference is that the Fermi level is now close to the valence band. This level here is close to the valence band. If we now bring both P 
p-type and n-type into contact, then for pr very principal reasons, the electrochemical potential, the Fermi level, becomes equal. They move into line. The Fermi level is now in line, left in the p-type and right in the n-type. This leads to a banding of the conduction band and the balance band. So they are they look like this one here, like a slope. And if we now create by means of a photon an electron hole pair, just as before, but in this case, due to the slope or the band banding, the electron and the hole are become split apart. The hole moves to the left and the electron moves to the right. And in this case, we can see and measure an external photocurrent. And these are the electrons that we need for splitting water into hydrogen. So, and if we now ask for uh, um, um, a measure or a quality uh, measure for the efficiency of our for um, uh, splitting, water splitting device, then it comes to the so-called solar hydrogen efficiency, eta STH, solar to hydrogen efficiency. And the larger the STH value, the better the cell or the better the device performs. And this efficiency is equal to the electrochemical potential difference times the photocurrent density, amps per square meter, over the solar irradiance, PIRR. So we can measure the photocurrent. We know the area of our device. We can also measure the solar irradiance, and we know the difference of the chemical potentials and thereby we can derive our solar to hydrogen efficiency. And now, te technologically, uh, uh, we can indeed realize and achieve such a system which is moderately integrated and turns photons into hydrogen molecules, two separate systems integrated into a single device. And, um, the German, or the, uh, in Germany, and the, the Paxis project, which has been operated and conducted by um, Hamburg Central Berlin and, and some other European countries as well. And they have demonstrated uh, uh, the combined or the integration of a PV cell and the E cell, EC cell, at the system level. What you can see here is, uh, this is a PV device up here, and to the right here, you can see the electrolyzer cell. So we have a photovoltaic cell here and electrolyzer cell here. And now I would like to show you a little video. So what we can see here is uh, the realization of a combined PV and EC cell on top of a roof. And these systems you see, they are completely autonomous. They don't need connection to the power grid. They just create the, photo, the electricity from the photons by means of the solar cell. And they have integrated into their system an electrolyzer cell to produce hydrogen. What they the team has demonstrated is that we can have a cost-efficient system, not at lab scale, but on production scale, industry scale, 10 square meters. What you see here is the kind of electrolyzer they use, PEM stands for proton exchange membrane. They are 
different types of electrolyzer technologies, and this is one of them. This is um, the predominant technology used nowadays. It may change, and it may change in the future, but nowadays it's a, a predominant technology for renewable energy. And we achieve STH values above 10%. That's not so bad if we consider that the system is standalone, does not use, does not acquire any uh, power grid. She can be installed of any, uh, even off the grid location, um, and we can use hydrogen for uh, powering our cars and uh, trains and so on even for heating purposes. They have used commercially available PV cells, so and they have been thin film, thin film solar cells, but commercially available. So here you can see the electrolyzer. You can see the, the, the gas tubes and the feed in the tubes for water and for uh, taking away the hydrogen uh, in gaseous uh, state. And it's all integrated within the same single device. No auxiliary power necessary, no grid required. So this, the project is now over. It has, uh, uh, was active during uh, 2007 until the end of 2020, and they have achieved a working demonstrator that turns really uh, photons into hydrogen molecules. OK, now let's go ahead. We have a, a quarter of an hour left. and. Now let's talk about uh, the final step of um, the final solution would be to integrate uh, the PV and the EC cell into a single device, which we call photoelectrochemical cell. And the what is special is that we in this device we can directly convert photons into hydrogen molecules. We don't need any bypass. It's not only, it's not really two devices. It's a single device with two functionalities. This is not, um, um, we cannot obtain these systems at industry level, but they are st still in the labs. How does such a photoelectrochemical cell work, which is the working principle? We have two steps. So first of all, we need a light absorber for the generation of the electron hole pairs. This is the first step. And once we have the electron hole pairs, we need to split them apart and to put them into the electrolytic cell for split the splitting of water. So the light absorption and the electrochemical reaction are within the same monolithically integrated device. Um, Yes, I will show you on the slides. The time has gone now, and um, uh, this, to, to, to do it on the slides is a little bit faster. So, consider this diagram here. So, we have a semiconductor here. And the semiconductor is N-type doped. So, the Fermi level is close to the bottom of the conduction band. And the semiconductor is a large band gap semiconductor with a large gap energy. Ideally, it could be three volts, electron volts or more. And then we have, on the cathode side, we have just a metal. The Fermi energy is just at the bottom of the conduction band. And we have an aqueous electrolyte. 
And you see in this aqueous electrolyte, you see the two energy levels or the two electrochemical potentials. And what is important is that the photoanode, the position of conduction band and valence band must straddle the position of the two electrochemical potentials of the electrolyte. This is just an ideal solution. In practice, it's much more difficult, but in principle, we can achieve such a solution. Okay, um, once we have those three components not brought into contact with each other, the situation looks like this one here. Once we bring into contact the photoanode with the electrolyte, then we will see a band bending. This is important. At the interface between the anode and the electrolyte, we have a band bending of the conduction band and the valence band. And this is the means how we uh, split the electron hole pairs apart. So we need, we need this. Um, and also the Fermi level of the left-hand side and the right-hand side are now in line. Okay, now if we have a photon with an energy larger than the band gap, H times nu is larger than Eg, but then we can create in the space charge area, which is the region where we have the band bending, we can create an electron hole pair, creating an electron in the conduction band and leaving behind a positive hole in the valence band. And because of the band bending, the electron will be uh, sucked to the left hand side, towards the left hand side of this electron, and the hole will be. Uh, um, will we'll, uh, tra travel to the interface between the anode and the aqueous electrolyte. Now, now we bring the anode and the cathode into electric contact. This, this means that the electrons that we can have created in the photoanode can travel along this part there may be some resistance in it and eventually arrive at the metal cathode. And now the electron is here and the hole has traveled to the interface between the semiconductor and the electrolyte. And now, if the energy level of the valence band here is a little bit less than the energy level of the H2O to O2 reaction, then the hole can go into the state and trigger the reaction. Likewise, the electron, if the energy level of this, this state here is higher than the H2, H, H plus H2 reaction, uh, electrochemical um, potential, then the electron can occupy this state here and trigger the cathodic reaction. So this means that um, on the an, uh, anode side, we have the oxygen evolution reaction, H2 plus two holes are, uh, yield one half mole of oxygen plus two protons. And on the cathodic side, we have the reaction two protons plus two electrons give one molecule of H2. So this is 
in an ideal electro photoelectrochemical cell. So this is just uh, a little bit idealized. So in fact, in reality, um, and that we don't have a single material which straddles the, uh, the energy levels of the electrolytes. So then we need to employ several tricks, but uh, and these are in principle possible. But the major the major problem and the biggest problem for such uh, PEC cells is the corrosion. Corrosion. Once we turn uh, and show you. You can see my um, I hope you can see my no my webcam is not there. I lost my webcam. Okay, then I show you with the other camera. So, okay, this is a glass of water. This is a silicon photovoltaic cell. Once we immerse our uh, photovoltaic device into the water, we have to deal with the problem of corrosion. This is one of the major problems of photoelectrochemical cells, but we have they have made large advances in the past years. So it may be just a, a question or a matter of years. Okay, so um, let me come to the conclusion. So in principle, we can do, can think of elect, uh, devices that turn the power of the sun into hydrogen molecules. The simplest way to do it is to have uh, the photovoltaic cell and the electrolyzer cell as separate devices connected over the public grid. But maybe for some um, application scenarios, it's a better solution to have them autonomously uh, connected, integrated into a single device and be placed on top of a roof, for example. That would be a PVEC solution. And the ultimate solution, which is still left for the future, would be have, uh, to have a PE cell that integrates both functionalities of the um, um, photon absorption and the electrochemical reaction into a single device, like this one, as has been shown here. This device here has been realized on lab scale, and there we have indeed a wide band semiconductor, bismuth vanadate, which is immersed into the electrolyte and is to some extent stable. And then we have a second semiconductor based on silicon. Um, and the challenge is to have such systems and under stable conditions and um, made up with um, earth abundant materials which are cheap. So it's not a, not so big a problem to have a system which is high expensive and very expensive materials, but this is not economically viable. The challenge is to find materials which are earth abundant, so they are cheap and they are which are which are stable in aqueous solution environment and which have the uh, desired reaction rates. Okay, uh, I think we should come to a close now and uh, I will thank you for your attention. And uh, maybe there are questions and I will be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I think the time is over now, but it's up to you how we can proceed now. Okay, there are no questions. So uh, please let me thank you for your attention and I wish you a pleasant stay at our Sustain MV week. Uh, I should mention tomorrow is uh, an interesting topic on this um, by Professor Jennifer Strunk from Likat in 
Rostock and uh, the talk will be on how to perform uh, chemistry by the use of light and I think uh, Professor Schunk will be more explicit and more detailed on uh, the question of catalysis, catalysis, so catalytic reactions uh, which I have spared uh, in my talk today. But please don't miss this talk, could be very interesting um, and it makes an extension of what we have heard today about uh, turning electrons or photons into electrons and then electrons into hydrogen molecules. Okay, thank you very much.